Well, good evening again, church. It is good to be here. As William said, my name is Scott Hickox, and I'm the lead pastor at the Journey West County. And yeah. And uh, this is my first time to preach at Tower Grove. It might be my last since I had Linus pre uh, read the scripture tonight. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the Charlie Brown Christmas special is sort of a, a tradition, and it's been around for, for over 50 years. That's a long time. And as I was thinking about that this week, there is, uh, there's some good news and some bad news that comes with that. Um, the bad news is, as I thought about that, I realized that, that I'm older than Charlie Brown. Uh, and that means I'm older than most of you here. The good news about that is that that has given me a lot of years uh, to be married to my wife. And uh, tonight, we're celebrating our 28th wedding anniversary. Uh, so we're celebrating that with you tonight. And we're excited uh, to be here. You know, Charlie Brown is known for, he's sort of known for that yellow shirt with the, the zigzag on there. Lucy's known as the one who pulls the football away every time Charlie gets ready to kick. And, and Linus is known for that blanket, right? His security blanket. He, he never lets it go. And throughout the story, uh, Charlie and Lucy and Snoopy, they're all trying to get him to put that blanket down. They encourage him. Sometimes they, they try and shame him, but he never uh, puts the blanket down. But what's interesting about Linus in the, in the Charlie Brown Christmas, as he recites the Christmas story there from Luke 2, is he actually puts the blanket down. Right when he recites the words that the angel spoke, when the angel said, fear not, he drops the blanket. And I think Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, I think he was reminding us of this beautiful truth, and that is when we behold Jesus, our fears subside. When, when we behold Jesus, our fears subside. See, the birth of Jesus frees us from the habits that we're unable or, un or unwilling to let go of. The birth of Jesus allows us to simply uh, drop that, that false security that we've been grasping onto and instead encourages us to, to trust and to cling to Jesus instead. The good news of Christmas is that, that we don't have to be afraid. Christmas reminds us that, that in our fear, Jesus drew near. The gospel is, is a bridge from fear to joy. And so tonight we're continuing in this, this Advent series that we've been in. We're looking at different themes of Advent each week. And remember, Advent simply means coming. And it's a season in the church calendar uh, it leading up to Christmas when we reflect on the coming of Jesus. I know a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Tim, uh, he preached about hope. And then last week, Pastor John preached on, on peace. And tonight we're going to look at joy. And as I was reflecting this week, I think it's ironic, though, that that all these themes that we talk about around Christmas time, hope and peace and joy, those are the things that oftentimes are so elusive to us, particularly at this time of year. Of all the wonderful promises contained in the Christmas story, um, the one that seems to be the most missing, I think, is, is joy. I mean, how many people do you know who would describe their life as, as full of great joy? And yet the proclamation by the angels to the shepherds was, was that this baby was going to be born. And he would bring good news of great joy, and it would be for all the people. The angels declared this joy. Mary and Joseph were, were amazed by joy. The wise men were, were filled with joy. The shepherds were told, left rejoicing. And if you go back even a little bit farther in the story, we didn't read that tonight, but if you go back, uh, Jesus' cousin John the Baptist while he was still in the womb of his mother, the scripture says that he leaped for joy in Elizabeth's womb. So the Christmas story is a story filled with joy. And yet I know that many of our lives are not. The, the truth is Christmas can be a really painful time of year for lots of people. There's loneliness, lost loved ones, unhealthy family dynamics, there's financial burdens, there, there are health issues, the list goes on and on. Christmas can be very hard for many people. And so my hope tonight is that we might see wh whether we're happy or, or sad, whether we're alone or with loved ones, regardless of what our circumstances are, my hope tonight is that this message of Christmas would be one of joy, of great joy, a joy that transcends all the pain and all the difficulties of life. So no matter what you're going through today, no matter what you're feeling, the message of Christmas is good news of great joy for all people. And Christmas doesn't change your circumstances, but it can change your perspective. Christmas doesn't change your circumstances, but it can change your perspective. You may not feel happy tonight, 
But the message of Christmas is filled with such hope and such wonder that I'm hoping that when we truly see that, that we might begin to experience his joy. And that's my prayer tonight, even for us during this Christmas season. So I just want to pray as we, as we enter in here. Let me just pray to that end for us. Father, you know we come in here, uh, we've come in out of the weather, we've come in from all different places, feeling all kinds of emotions. Lord, in many of us, a joy seems like a distant dream to this. So I pray tonight um, that you would open our eyes to see this good news of great joy, that you might even tonight help us begin to experience the joy that you have for us. So we need you. Uh, We need your spirit to move in this place. We need your spirit to teach us. And so I pray now, Lord, that you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, when you, when you think about joy, what, what comes to mind for you? How, would you? how would you define joy? I did some looking on the internet. I, I kind of pieced together a definition I pulled from different things, but I thought these were very good, so I put them all together. Joy is a happy strength, a, a bold confidence, a, an abiding peace, an, an inner celebration regardless of what's going on around us. That's what joy is. And I would argue that that everyone wants that. I would would argue that that everyone wants to experience that kind of joy. And yet far too often we we allow our circumstances to rob us of that joy. To keep us from being able to experience that joy. When I was thinking about this, thinking about the word as it's defined here, a bold confidence, an abiding peace. A couple, a couple things came to mind for me. First was uh, some friends of ours in Kansas City. We came from Kansas City about four years ago. Uh, some dear friends of ours. I didn't meet them until their, their 18-month-old daughter was diagnosed with a brain tumor. That was my first introduction to them. And, and so Marley had surgery on this tumor. They removed the tumor, and, and, and we felt like things were good. And the, and the following day, then she had a massive stroke, and it was paralyzed on the right side of her body. And for the next 18 months, uh, she battled until uh, she passed away at three years of age. And I can still remember uh, the funeral, uh, even as I think about it. Tears come. Uh, I had the privilege of being a part of that. And at the end of the service, they, the family wanted a time to, to worship through song. And I can still remember being on the stage, looking out a sanctuary with probably over a thousand people, people standing and singing, and on the front row were Marley's mom and dad, hands raised, praising God. Tears were flowing. They were were grieving intensely. They were not happy, but they had joy. See, their hope was not in their circumstances. Their hope was in God. Now, I'm not suggesting that how, that's how it looks for everyone. That's not what I'm saying. That's not how it looked for me, and it wasn't my daughter. But what stands out to me is that there is something that transcends how we feel in the moment. When we have confidence in who God is, and we have hope in his promises, then we can actually have joy despite what's going on around us. I was also thinking about, I was thinking about Haiti a lot this week. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to travel to Haiti on dozens of occasions. I don't know how much you know about Haiti, but, but about 80% of the people there, there live beneath the poverty line. The average uh, annual per capita income is $350. $350 a year. That's the average income in Haiti. And yet the believers in Haiti, they don't seem to be phased by that. They're, they're content. They're some of the most joyful people I've ever met. And I remember... Just particularly, I had the privilege, I was invited to go and preach, actually. A friend of mine was a pastor at a church, so he invited me to come preach on the one-year anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti. And I, I went down there in a place, a sanctuary about this size. They had rebuilt their church in a year. Certainly not this nice, but a building about this big. It was filled with people, probably 2,000 people jammed into this place. There was a balcony across the back, um, no ocean, no fire codes. There was no railing on the balcony. Hundreds of people on the balcony. I stood out for a couple of reasons in the place. First of all, I was the only white guy in the place. Secondly, I was the only person who hadn't lost a friend or a family member in the earthquake. 
Everyone in the place had lost someone dear to them. Everyone. And for about three hours, they sang and they danced and they prayed and they testified to God's goodness. I mean, I'll never forget it. It was incredible. They were so full of joy. And so as I've reflected on those two situations, I found myself really in the moment, certainly surprised by their response. I mean, how could they respond like that in the midst of, of suffering? And yet I think they were a picture of what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians. They were, they were sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And I realized that only God could make that possible. I remember, remember what we said about joy. It's a, it's a happy strength, a bold confidence, an abiding peace, an inner celebration regardless of what's going on around us. I like think our passage tonight tells us a few things about joy, and here's what I hope we see in just our short time. Where it comes from, who it's for, and where it's going. That's what I think we'll see in the passage. If you look in your Bibles, beginning in verse 9, first is where did it come from? How can we have strength and confidence and peace regardless of our circumstances? The passage tells us that when the angels showed up that they were filled with great fear. But the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The angel said the shepherds could go from fear to joy because of this good news. And if you look ahead in verse 11, we see what the good news is. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, at the journey, if you've been around much, we talk a lot about the gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. And Christmas reminds us of the gospel. It reminds us of this good news. And, and the reason that it's so good is, is that apart from it, the news was really bad. I mean, the Bible says that all of us were, were sinners. All of us. And I know what some of you may be saying. You're saying, well, the Bible is old. It's, it's antiquated. That's harsh and negative. I don't, I don't believe that. But here's the truth. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, we, we realize we don't need the Bible to tell us that. I think we all know down deep. And this is the fear that we have. This is what we wrestle with. We, don't, we, we fear that we don't measure up. We know that we've, we've failed. We, we fear being rejected. And we need someone to save us. We, we need someone to rescue us from that fear, from the guilt, from the shame that we feel. We need someone who can help us stop sinning. We need someone to save us from the grip of death and enable us to live forever. What we need is a, is a Savior. I mean, if the world's greatest need was a military victory, then God would have sent a general. If, if the world's greatest need was technology, God would have sent an inventor. If the world's greatest need was, was financial, he would have sent an economist. If it was information, he would have sent an educator. But the world's greatest need was salvation. And so he sent a savior. If you've, if you've been around church, you, you know John 3.16. You've heard that verse. It's a beautiful promise in the Bible. Maybe you've never been around church, but just you've been at a sporting event. You've seen that on a sign, John 3.16. It is a beautiful promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Again, that is a beautiful promise. But sometimes we miss John 3, 17, the next verse, and I think it's equally as important. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, what Christmas reminds us is that, that God loved us so much. He, he loved us enough to enter into time and space, to enter into the brokenness of the world to enter in as a baby and then to grow and to live a life, a perfect life, a life that we should have lived, to go to the cross, to die a death that we deserve, to rise again, to conquer sin and death and hell. And if we simply believe in that, even though we don't deserve it, we can be forgiven of our past. We can have, we can have peace with God in the present. That's the hope, or excuse me, that's the peace that we talked about. And then we have those promises of his that we will be with him forever. We have hope. The gospel is the only thing that brings real hope, true peace, lasting joy. 
Now, church, if that's not good news to you, if that message of salvation doesn't stir some joy in your hearts, then, then either you've never been saved or you've forgotten what you've been saved from. Maybe we need to remember what we once were. The Bible tells us we were, we were dead, we were blind, we were, we were not free, we were slaves to, to our passions. All of us were lost, and we would have never found Jesus on our own. We could have never climbed up to God on our own, and so that's what the good news of Christmas is, that, that he knew that, and so he came down to us. Jesus came down to us, not to condemn us, but to save us. He came to seek and to save the lost. That's who we are. We were lost. It's a message of salvation. It is good news of great joy. And when the shepherds received this good news, the passage tells us that they went to Bethlehem to see. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby. They told them all the things that had happened to them. And if you skip ahead a bit, it tells us what happened after that. Look at verse 20. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying And praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Bible says that the shepherds returned with with joy in their hearts. They had gone from great fear to great joy because of the good news. But think about this. The the shepherds are returning to what? They're returning to shepherding, right? Did, Did anything about their circumstances change? See, nothing changed. After they saw the baby Jesus, they were still poor. They were still considered outcasts. Their their testimony still would not hold up in court. The sheep still smelled bad and needed care. See, their circumstances didn't change at all, but they were full of joy. They had joy, not not just because they had heard this good news. It was more than that. They were filled with joy because they realized who this good news actually was for. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angel said, for unto you. A Savior has been born for you. I mean, imagine what this would have meant to the shepherds. They were the outcasts of society and God's amazing love was was for them. They, They... They were dirty. They were homeless. Again, they were the outcasts of society. They weren't considered trustworthy. They couldn't go in the temple because they worked and handled animals. They weren't allowed to offer sacrifices. They couldn't go in the temple and worship. And yet, think about this. Immediately after God incarnate was born, this announcement of the good news didn't go to the ruling elite. It didn't go to the religious elite. They went to the outcasts of society. It's a beautiful thing about Christmas. God, the Christmas story reminds us that God came to those who couldn't come to him on their own. See, Christmas reminds us that, that the good news is not just for the good. It's not just for those who, who act like they have their lives together. In fact, Jesus said he didn't come for the healthy, he came for the sick. He came for you And for me, that's good news, church. That that ought to stir some joy in our hearts. The good news is is personal. Maybe one more verse uh, just to drive this home. I think it's maybe one of the most stunning verses in the Bible. Zephaniah 3.17 says this. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. The God of the universe sings over you. See, this good news is is personal. He rejoices over you. God rejoices in you. That ought to stir joy in our hearts. Church, Christmas is good news of great joy. This, This good news is personal. One more thing. This message is for you, but it's not just for you. The message is personal. The good news is personal, but it's also public. Look at verse 10. Where is this good news going? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This good news is for all the people. It is intended to be shared. 
Just as the angels brought this announcement to the shepherds, God has someone for you to bring this announcement to. Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's uh, someone at your school, maybe it's the barista at Starbucks. I don't know who it is, but, but even as I'm talking right now, some of you are thinking of that person. Maybe you have a picture of them in your mind right now. Don't let that go. Ask God to give you an opportunity to talk to that person, to share this good news of great joy. There are people all around us who don't know this good news of great joy. And that's why we talk a lot around here as a church about being on mission. We're called to be on mission where we live and where we work and where we play. And yet it goes beyond that. The angel said this is good news of great joy for all people. That's why Jesus in his great commission said we're to make disciples where? Of all nations, right? We're to be as witnesses to the ends of the earth. Church, there are over 2 billion people in the world who have never heard the name of Jesus. And we're called, we are invited to proclaim that name to them. Now, I'm, I'm praying for us as a church in this new year in 2017 that, that God might grow our hearts for the nations, for, for international missions. I'm praying he might even send some in this room to go to the unreached peoples of the world. You can be watching in the new year for updates, for opportunities to pray, trips that you might go on. But God's plan is to share this good news, for us to, to share this with others. And his plan is to use us to do that. This is how God designed it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about it, I think, this doesn't seem like a great plan. I mean, how about the angels? The shepherds probably thought that was pretty cool, right? Let's just have angels everywhere, but that's not how God has designed it. Now, why would he have us do it? He certainly doesn't need us. He's God. He doesn't need us to do this, so why? I think it's because we need it. Listen to these words from 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we had, have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He's talking about Jesus here. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. See, for our joy to be complete, we have to share it with other people. And again, intuitively, I think we know this to be true, right? I mean, there's something in us. When we, when we experience something that we enjoy, we want to tell other people about it. Have you ever been about a, around a grandparent that has a new grandbaby? What do they want to do? They want to show you pictures, right, to talk about this grandbaby. Maybe when you hear a new song, music, maybe you've been listening to the, the, the Hamilton soundtrack, you want to share one of those songs. Maybe you've been fortunate enough to see it in person. You want to tell other people about that. I guarantee you tomorrow when I get to church, assuming we don't cancel, uh, when, I, when I get there, there's going to be people talking about Star Wars. The new movie just came out, and there's, there's some people in my church that love this movie. There's one guy in particular, he gets so excited about it, I know he's going to be so excited to tell me all about the movie. And listen, I don't care about Star Wars. I have no interest, but I'll probably be tempted to go just because of what he says. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, the expression of our delight of joy is the consummation of the joy itself. Listen to that again. The expression of our delight of joy is the consummation of the joy itself. You see, for our joy to be complete, we have to share it with others. And so I just ask you tonight, like, where are you on the, the joy meter? You know, how's your joy? And my guess is there will be a, a direct correlation to how much you're sharing the good news. Remember I told you about my brothers and sisters in Haiti. Um, their life is hard. And you know what? Every time I go there, you know what they want to talk about? They want to talk about Jesus. They're not talking about all the things that God hasn't done. They're talking about all the things that God has done. The lives that they've seen change, the things they've seen him do in their life. They want to talk about that. See, the more we talk about the good news, 
the more our joy will grow and the more complete it will be. Just like me and, and Star Wars, as other people see our joy, they're going to be more interested in Jesus. They're, they're going to want to know more. They're going to ask more questions. We have a privilege to be like the angels, to be heralds of this good news, to share this with others. Tell others the good news of great joy. And Christmas is a wonderful time to do that. People are, are oftentimes more open to this than any other time, so talk to them. Invite them to Christmas Eve service. Make your joy complete by sharing it with others. The angel said, said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So here's a question I want you to consider as we go. And the question is simply this. Um, is this good news to you? The angel said, I bring good news of great joy. Does it, does it seem good to you? Or is there other news in your life that's, that's crowding out the good news? Is there something else that's smothering this, this, the great joy that ought to be coming from this news? Or maybe some of you are, are just waiting for news. You're waiting for some news that you think is going to be better than this good news. Listen, the good news, this is not good news because it offsets the bad news in your life. This is good news because it is your life. The good news of Christmas is that you no longer live alone. Scripture says that the life you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God. And then when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Did you hear that? Christ, who is your life. He is your life. He doesn't compete with the bad news. He, he, he doesn't say, I'm sorry about this bad news. I'll try and offset that with some, some good news of my own. Instead, he says, I'll take you as my own. And any bad news that, that comes your way, we will endure it together. I'll be with you. I'll make you stronger. I'll make you more joy-filled in the midst of it. And that, church, is good news. Christmas may not change your circumstances, but it can change your perspective. So let me pray to that end. Father, we confess far too often we uh, do not live lives full of joy. Um, so Lord, I pray during this season, again, even tonight, that you might begin to stir something in our hearts, that you might remind us of this good news that we would remember apart from it, Lord, that we were lost, that we were dead, and that you, out of your great love, you sent Jesus down to us, not to condemn, but to save. So Lord, may that good news uh, just stir our hearts, may it stir joy in our hearts, and Lord, may you compel us, may you, uh, may you give us the courage to complete that joy by sharing it with other people. Lord, we, we live in a world in desperate need, a world that is desperate to hear the good news. I pray you do that in Jesus' name. Amen.